the beautiful, the sophisticated, the fabulous Jen McCormick. Say hello, Jen. Hello. Guys, we appreciate all of you being here. We know that it's the end of November. It's renewal season. You're all busy. And the fact that hundreds of you have still decided to join us on what's a, this ugly day here in Boston, we appreciate it wholeheartedly. So, as you can tell, we have a little new look. Can you go back to that first slide really quick, sir? We have a, a new look, and this is a sneak peek for 2018 of what all of our webinars are going to look like, all of our podcasts, all of our presentations across the country. Every year we update not only the way the slides look, the background, but we also update what we want to talk about. And I think it's pretty interesting. I'm planning on showing Ron, he doesn't even know this, but next week I'm planning on showing Ron what our top 10 issues of the industry are every year going back like 10 years as we've been doing this. And you'll notice, you know, I think in 2009 we started talking about, hey, reference-based pricing might be one of those things. Yeah, you know. It, yeah, it's pretty funny. But anyways, this is the new look that we have. And what we're going to talk about today is living in the now, preparing for 2018. What we did, and you'll see it on our next slide, these are all our speakers here. What you'll notice here on LinkedIn, as you all know, feel free to follow our LinkedIn page at Fear Group, as well as following Ron Peck and, and myself and everyone else here. What we realized is we wanted to get feedback from everybody as to what they believe are the things that we need to prepare for in 2018. And we realized it ran the table from specialty drugs to narrow networks, we're hearing over and over again, more networks are becoming more narrow. That might be a response to reference-based pricing. Sure. You, make, you keep the networks relevant by making them narrower, deeper discounts. We're hearing more about incentivizing employees to care about the cost of care, what we call here the PhD level of self-funding. Specialty drugs I mentioned, overseas purchase of drugs, just a bunch of different things that we're going to focus on as we discuss living in the now and what really needs to be done. But before we get into that, I want to make sure we spend a little time with Brady and President Trump. Brady, he's back from Asia, is that correct? I think in a couple of days. I'm not sure if it's today or tomorrow. So he's still traveling. I figured you were the first person to call when I got back. Brady. <laughs> I, I'm surprised he has to tweet Brady directly. <laughs> I've been trying to get attention, yeah. So we, got, uh, we have Brady here to talk about the political update and what's happening out there uh, across the industry and how it's going to affect. Most importantly, Brady, don't forget what we always say. What we care about is how everything at DC is going to affect our clients and their clients as well. So with that, Brady. Thanks, Adam. Well, thankfully, much of what happens in DC does actually directly affect us. And so if you've been following anything going on in DC lately, aside from all the other sideshows, you'll notice that tax reform has really been the big subject in the last few weeks. The administration's pushing hard to get something passed um, before the end of the year. They didn't really succeed on the ACA the first time around, and there's a bunch of other developments on the regulatory side. But that said, tax reform does have an impact potentially on the Affordable Care Act and on our industry. And so as you can see here, this photo of uh, the president has his little postcard where his goal is to get pretty much everything you need to know about your taxes onto one little postcard. We'll see if that actually happens. But part of his plan um, is solving the Republicans' math problem. They have a math problem right now with tax reform that's kind of similar to what they had with Obamacare itself, meaning they're trying to pass this legislation with 51 votes. In order to do so, they have to be under $1.5 trillion in terms of deficit spending over the next 10 years. And in both versions of the tax reform bill, they're currently over that number. And so they're looking for things they can move around in the bill to get below that number. There's been a bunch of discussion about tax deductions they may try to tinker with, things that were annoying different factions of um, different industry players from the mortgage interest tax, uh, tax deduction to state and local tax deductions. But one appetizing new issue that's come up for the, the president who tweeted about it yesterday is removing the individual mandate. Um, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, has estimated that if they repeal the individual mandate, that could save um, 300 or so billion dollars over 10 years. That would get them below the magic $1.5 trillion number they need to pass tax reform. Now, you may be asking, how does that save money? Well, because if you repeal the individual mandate, the CBO projects that many people currently on the Obamacare exchanges who are receiving subsidies will drop that coverage. So the government will be paying out less money in subsidies. More people would lose coverage, but the result would be they would save money over time and get them under that number. And of course, you know, whether this happens or not, it remains to be seen. There's two versions of the tax reform bill. 
Uh, the House is projected to vote on one, I think, this week, and the Senate is supposed to, after Thanksgiving, take up that final bill. But expect that they could plug and play these numbers in such a way that they may impact the ACA. And so we'll be watching to see what happens with that. Also, we want to update um, you guys on Obamacare enrollment. It's definitely open enrollment season for most of our clients, and it is, of course, on the exchanges. And actually, surprisingly, it seems like the enrollment numbers so far are up by a lot, um, over 80% from last year. So despite the cutting the open enrollment period in half that Trump did, uh, despite cutting back some of the, the funding for outreach, um, 600,000 people have enrolled in the first four days of open enrollment on Obamacare exchanges. So there could be a bunch of reasons for that, but that's a surprising number. So real quick, but you know, sorry for making you go back. Yeah. I was hoping someone would jump in and ask the question. But the individual mandate, how does yeah. that affect self-funding? If, if the individual mandate is on a chopping block, well, how will that affect our industry? Yeah, so I mean, one of the ways would be if you have young, healthy employees who are on your self-funded plan, they may choose not to have coverage. They may oh. say, right, they may say, I don't need to have coverage. I'm a young invincible, like Ron is, for example. Well, like me say, or Jen. Oh, right. right. Maybe not right. me. Maybe not me, but, 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 I mean, that could be one of the ways you're impacted. So, if you, so basically, if you have 200 employees like we do, right. I might have 50 employees that say, you know what, even though Fee has amazing health insurance and it's really cheap for me, I can just not have insurance at all and put that extra 50 bucks in my pocket every week. Right, right, and so that may create an unadded task for our for our on, so, so our plan will be a sicker plan. We can't offset the cost of the healthy employees, and now we turn into more like the exchange. So this right. is a, not a good thing, potentially, for the self-funded industry. You know, Adam, one of the things, and I remember when they first came out with the individual mandate, a lot of individuals said, I'd rather just pay the penalty than buy the insurance. Right. Because everyone my does, best friend said that. People do a cost-benefit analysis. So I think what this says, Adam, for self-funding, and, and what you're talking about, and hopefully some of the things we'll talk about today, is that if you're an employer and you want everybody to be on your plan, particularly those attractive lives Brady was talking about, to offset the less attractive lives, you need to identify a way to make your plan so high benefit, low cost, that those individuals, after they do a cost-benefit analysis, it's worth the money. Yeah, that's a lot easier said than done, though. Believe All right, so with that, um, you, go, you were talking about the Obamacare exchange and yeah. enrollment is up. Why do you think that's the case? I, I mean, I think part it's because there's a bit of a panic being created right now with mm -hmm. Trump has been withholding the, uh, the CSR payments to insurance companies. The, a the ACA is in a state that I'm sort of calling muddling through right now. It's, it's in a state of flux. It's, it's just sort of just going on the way it is. The president has really realized that Congress is unable to dismantle the law. He's resorted to using the power of the pen. And to that end, there's a couple new updates we want to update you on. And one of them is the new rules that have been proposed by CMS regarding essential health benefits. Now, importantly, these are proposed rules only. They're not interim or final rules. There's a long way to go here, but some of the ideas being pitched would be permitting states to essentially modify um, essential health benefits in their state. So that would give them a lot more flexibility um, and allow them to take a larger role in certifying qualified health plans, or as we know them, benchmark plans, as a way to lower cost of individual and group health plans. So we'll see what happens with that, but in theory, I think what you'd see would be you'd be able to say reduce coverage for prescription drug coverage and increase benefits for, say, maternity or reduce for mental health and increase some other one. So basically, if you imagine a switchboard, you can sort of tinker with the dials, and we'll see if that's what the states are allowed to do, but we'll be following that one because it's important for our industry. Um, other, other update on the, the birth control uh, mandate rollback we talked about last time, um, five states at least are now joining a lawsuit asking the federal government to or a federal, a federal judge, rather, to block the, um, the rollback of the birth control mandate. You'll recall that the, uh, the president signed an executive order, which basically expanded who could object to having to provide um, concept of coverage. And you'll, you now can, if you have a moral objection to providing coverage, you'll be allowed to opt out of that. And um, in the eyes of many states, they believe that violates the spirit of the ACA and are hoping that can be blocked. So go back to that point. Again, sorry for speaking as a self-funded employer myself. I could have just a moral objection. What's that threshold? Is there a level? Is there two objective? different things to consider here when we're talking about the concept of man? I can't. I'm sorry, I can't help myself jumping Go in. Go for it, Jen. Sure. <laughs> so the first thing is that under the current regulations, there's an opportunity for you as a self-funded employer to say, I want an exemption. So based on my or my moral objections, my beliefs my reasonable belief, whatever that may or may not be, 
And if you have a exemption, that means not only do you not have to cover it, but your administrator doesn't have to do anything. So your TPA, who previously, through the accommodation process, would have had to otherwise arrange for coverage and right. then get offset through right. the exemption. TPAs had to do that, and everyone was yep. freaking out about it because right. Who's going to pay for it? Right, they don't right. premium. But now I can say, as everyone knows of me being an upstanding moral individual, I could say, I'm standing, why is everyone rolling their eyes? Uh, everyone's rolling their eyes. I'm allergic to, yeah, I'm having an allergic reaction. The folks, reaction, on, the folks online know. can't see your faces right now, but am I not a moral man? That's oh. ridiculous. <laughs> Anyways, let's just pretend, okay? I can say, I don't want to cover this. Literally, the administrator doesn't have to process the claim. Nothing. Nope. And that's it. So this is what these five states are fighting? Right, yeah. And they may win on a procedural point here because when you revoke rules like this or when you announce new rules, you're supposed to provide notice or adequate notice and allow for comments as required under federal law. That didn't really happen here. And so we'll see how the federal court in California rules on this issue. But uh, more and more states' attorneys general are joining, the, joining that issue. Great insight, Brady. Including Massachusetts. Right. Okay, another big development. Yesterday, um, surprisingly, I think from overseas, the president announced um, a new candidate for HHS secretary. So this person, Alex Azar, would be replaced the, uh, the position um, which was vacated by Tom Price, who had some issues with airline travel. Wait, um, this guy is a former big pharma exec? Yeah, so that's, that's going to help our industry, huh? I wanted to get to Lower drug, drug, drug costs. <laughs> this guy has some connections. I know we have some slides on this later, but essentially... Yeah, I mean, one of the big sticking points in the Trump administration early on was they wanted to, you know, control the cost of rising drug prices. And so he, yeah, nominated this guy. He's taking a lot of heat in the press right now. You know, maybe we'll give him a fair shot before we, you know, make some determinations about him. But, but you know what? He's a form of big lobbyist. Here. Just, think about it. You hire someone who knows how to make rates really high, expensive, right. is the right guy to fix oh, them. Yeah, he knows right. what's going on. Right. You know, he knows what's going on. Right. So, you know, we'll see what he, he could surprise us here. But the president said, you know, he'll be a star for better health care and lower drug prices. We'll see how that goes. And one quick note also on this is that Politico was reporting the White House is considering another executive order targeting drug prices in particular. Unclear the details on that. I'll be watching to see. That could be very interesting. To follow. Before you go to the next slide, we all love Brady's, you know, what do we call them, Ron? <laughs> I'm going to call them the predictions. The predictions. So, Brady, what are we predicting? I mean, we have one more webinar. For those of you who don't know, the next one's going to be on December 19th, right before Christmas. So I'm assuming all these guys will already be home for the holidays, correct? So I'm just going, right? So yes, they so, will be. What's going to happen between now and our next webinar, Brady? What is your big prediction? Man. Um, I think they'll strike a deal with um, stabilizing the exchanges. I don't think we'll get anything big on drug prices. I don't think that'll happen yet. I think he may get confirmed. That'll be a surprise to me. But I do expect action on the Obamacare exchanges. They're in a dangerous situation. And you expect action on a – what do you think about the tax bill? I know it's not health care, but we're going to ask oh, them. Oh, yeah. I don't, think I, I don't think that passes. So All right, so that's not going to pass. Brady said it here first, and something will happen regarding the Obamacare exchange. Right, so hold me to that. We'll, you know, we'll I'm disappointed about the drugs, Brady. I wanted to get some on discount for Black Friday. But yeah, we, we could use that. All right. So one, one last update here, and it's on a state side. And the reason why I bring up Massachusetts is not because we're just based in Massachusetts, but we are a health care leader as a state. And the Senate in Massachusetts – uh, commissioned a study a month or so ago where they were looking at the top cost drivers in the state. They identified two major areas that are unsurprising to our industry, which is, of course, hospital costs and prescription drug costs. And the Senate passed on November 10th, late, late in the day, a cost containment bill, um, which sadly, and I think Ron will have more to say on this, wasn't really all it was billed to be, no pun intended. <laughs> um, but what, what happened was they, there's some recommendations in the bill, you know, increase the use of alternative payment methodologies. Well, we know what that means, right? That means like RBP plans and, and repricing claims and just stop paying these insanely high, high prices, encouraging value-based choice. So they looked at things like how can we reduce hospital readmissions, which are very costly, um, increasing consumer awareness, and mitigating provider price variation. So in Massachusetts, we have a, a, a unique problem, arguably in the nation, of these teaching hospitals, which are paid significantly higher reimbursement rates than other community hospitals in the area. And the result is that we have struggling hospitals that are you know, not Mass General, for example, and they have a hard time competing, and that arguably leads all the prices to go up because then consumers have fewer choices to make among where the, uh, between where they'll be seen and they end up going to these very expensive hospitals to have a baby and for other routine procedures that arguably should be performed or could be performed performed at lower cost facilities. So, Ron, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this, Bill? Yeah, Brady. And you know, I posted something on LinkedIn. I think I was pretty politically correct. I think my I think my email to you and Adam. I used the word puke three times. My biggest issue 
and, and this isn't just unique to this. This was the same thing we saw with Romney Care. This is the same thing we saw with Obamacare and now here, is that the, the foundation, the idea behind the bill itself is to address the quote unquote cost of health care. And it's a noble cause. And I agree, I agree that the insurance issue is one part of the overall expense of health care. But that the the study that you referenced before specifically cited issues of variance in cost, but not just variance, but excessive cost. The fact that a lot of the providers they researched couldn't justify the charge. It seemed like it was almost random. They had just put their numbers in a hat and pulled one out. And yet, when you look at the bill, they don't address those issues at all. They really hone in and focus in on, well, if insurance doesn't pay enough, someone right. goes out of network and insurance doesn't pay enough, that person may be balanced billed. We have to do something to protect them from balanced billing. Well, if I'm a uh, you know, you're, you're, you're out there, you know, Joe or Jane reading this, and I hear insurance isn't paying enough for out-of-network claims, and that's why I'm being balanced billed, you know what the solution for that is? Get insurance to pay more, so I won't be balanced billed. There's nothing wrong with the bill. The only question is who's paying for it. All right, Ron has smoke coming out of his ears. I want to take a step, take a deep breath. But really, really quick on this piece, the one area that I think we have to focus on as well is that there's more and more out-of-pocket maximums, I and mean, the, the, the reality is more and more patients are being required to step up and pay a piece of the bill. So I think encouraging and increasing consumer awareness of what their options are so that they realize that if you have a $5,000 deductible, there are actual places where you can go that are costing $800 versus 8000 I think that's the key. You address the, the cost, key. and maybe you start to create better options for those consumers. Right. right. And, one, and one last thing to sum up, I think this is, represents a step in the right direction. And if you look at this bill, it's a sign nationally that perhaps the governments are, are, are shifting their focus toward providers and saying, hey, peeking under the covers, what are they charging and why are they charging so much? So we'll, we'll see what else develops from this bill. Great job, Brady. So let's, with that, let's turn it over to Jen, who's going to talk about what was October's most frequently asked questions with that. Jim McCormick, take it over. All right. And that's why you have even more, Ron. But probably in response to all of your articles and input about Macy's, we have been getting a lot of questions about how the Macy's case is going to impact self-funded I think sales is up at Macy's because of you. <laughs> I was going to say, that the, the, the I went to Macy's this weekend just because you kept talking about the Macy's case. I think that the cost of the sweater you wanted is going to go up. That's probably the first that's impact. That's unfortunate. You'll that's unfortunate. So, the big thing to remember with the Macy's case is there were two issues. One was related to wellness, which we are not talking about. The other more important piece was that a plan was being administered inconsistently with the terms of the plan document. I hate that. <laughs> Can you fire it up yet? <laughs> so when it relates to renewal season, what we should be thinking about, how this case is going to have an impact on our industry, obviously the first thought is, maybe I should take a look at my plan document and review it to make sure that the provisions are in line with my intentions, my expectations, and the benefits that I want to offer for my plan participants and my employees. So this is a great time at the end of the year. We're getting ready for renewal, making those updates to our documents to make those revisions. Hopefully there's not a situation where there was a vendor or a pricing methodology that had been implemented similar to the Macy's case where the plan tried to do its best to contain costs or to put some measures in place that would be beneficial on the savings, but not necessarily actually making those changes into the document. And one of the things we also like to remind people is just because you're making a change or modification to your plan document, the changes in the notice requirements don't stop there. You also have to notice, notify your stop loss carrier to make sure that any changes and modifications that are being made to reflect your true intentions how the plan should and you desire for it to be administered are available and everyone is aware of that so it doesn't impact any of your underwriting. The next question that we're seeing is uh, about grandfathered status. So although some may not necessarily believe it, there still are some grandfathered plans that exist. It is true. And there are others that are looking for a way or an opportunity to potentially minimize their costs or potentially carve out a classification of eligible individuals. So with the employer mandate still in place, um, we know that the plan is still required to cover dependent children through the age of 26. But there's nowhere in ERISA, nowhere in ACA that specifically requires a self-funded plan to cover spouses. So there's an opportunity there to add maybe a spousal surcharge if the dependent spouse has coverage through a 
uh, their own employer plan or even potentially carve out spouses in their entirety. So if a grandfather plan wanted to add this carve out or this category of uh, or eliminating a class of coverage, would that impact their grandfather status? Our two general rules when it comes to losing grandfather status are that you can't eliminate a benefit or increase the cost to participants. So that in itself of just removing those individuals, it is our interpretation that that is not going to cause you to loss your grandfather status. But if the premium or the contribution to spousal coverage is tied to the contribution for your employee contribution, then that potentially could be a situation where you're increasing the cost of the coverage. So potentially, depending on how the premiums or the contribution structure is set up, that could cause the loss of grandfather status. So independent of the actual act of carving out the individuals, this is a good example where you need to take a deeper dive into the situation and see the full impact of what that change would be. The last question is, have the agencies published rules on how the employer mandate penalties will be assessed or paid? Yes, the answer is yes. We finally have some notice about what is gonna happen and how these employer mandate penalties are gonna be assessed, not the individual mandate penalties. Got it. <laughs> so there was a recent letter that was uh, issued that outlines what the process of notification is going to be. This outlines the rules, what information an employer is gonna ask to provide in order to potentially defend their decision to why a penalty should or should not apply. And the scary thing about this notice is that these fees and penalties are gonna be starting to be seen by employers in the next couple of months. So we're expecting to see these potential penalties. So if you actually receive a letter from the IRS about a penalty or an assessment, make sure that you're asking on it because you only have 30 short days to take action and to defend your, your right or the uh, choices or decisions that you made. And feel free to call Jen or email Jen to ask any questions about this stuff because you're way too into this, Jen, just so you know. <laughs> That's a little strange. Now, back to me, getting involved. Just so all of you know, we talked about the Macy's case. Ron has written about it ex exhaustively. We all know. The issue is, okay, what is the lesson learned? And the lesson learned is that you must get involved. What do I mean by that? Your plan document, for those of you who heard me speak years ago when I first got married and how my wife just spent all of our money all the time on our shopping sprees. She doesn't do that anymore because we have four children now. <laughs> but I used to call, our, your plan document should literally be an instruction guide to an administrator as to how to pay your claims. Very simple. That's what it is. It's claim comes in, is it pay coverable, covered or not? And then if so, how much do I pay on it? If not covered, how do you appeal it? And who's responsible for making that decision? That's basically what we're talking about here. So the Macy's case teaches you that your claims process needs to match your SPD. So you don't just promise them what benefits there are. It's also a way when you have a well-written plan doc and you, have a, and you have a robust benefit program, it's a way to actually recruit new employees. It's the number one thing that we utilize to actually get people like, you think Brady wanted to work here? No. Hey, come on. <laughs> but Brady is an extremely sick individual, and he saw our, our employee benefit plan and realized – it is the best coverage I can get anywhere in Massachusetts. Wow. I need to come to work at FIA. You got me. <laughs> but what you want to do is when you have your employees, and we're going to talk about incentivizing employees later on, the key areas that people are hurting right now are specialty drugs. Okay? Deal with that in your SPD. Through incentives. Through network discounts. The network is too big. Okay, more narrow network. Incentivize steerage. I am afraid to make the claim decisions because I'm worried about stop loss. I'm worried about my handbook. I'm worried about eligibility. Okay, pass on that fiduciary buck to a third party. Keep it simple, stupid. A lot of times it's very simple as that. We have seen language that is so complicated that four attorneys in our office will have four different answers. So what you want to do at this point in time, try to keep it simple. Try to ensure that every single pain point has a Band-Aid within your plan doc. And then make sure this is the time of year where people start choosing stop-loss carriers. Now is the time to make sure that you identify any gaps. Make sure if they are gaps, they're hard gaps, not soft ones. And if you have a gap, make sure you clarify and understand what the reasoning is behind it, as well as looking at your employee handbook and making sure that if you're updating the SPD, do you also need to update the employee handbook as well. So, Jen, we're going to turn it over to you. What's the first thing we want people to do for 2018? All right, so as we're getting ready for 2018, one of the things that we like to do at FIA, we like to consider ourselves 
ahead of the curve when it comes to this is we ask our employees about their benefits. We consider our employee benefit plan to be very valuable. It's a benefit. It's an employee benefit. So what can we do to make sure that our individuals, our employees, are receiving the benefits that they want and deserve? So what do we do? We pull the staff. We ask them, taking a look at the benefits that we've offered over the past year, 2017, what changes do you recommend? Are there certain things that you would suggest that we potentially modify or update? Should we add something that doesn't already exist in our plan? And we take that feedback and we revise our plan document to make sure we reflect the benefits that are truly important to our plan participants and accordingly, we'll revise our employer handbook if necessary to reflect those benefit changes. The next thing that we need to do as we're getting ready for 2018 is you should look at your pain points. You should look to see if there's an opportunity where you can contain a cost, maybe by an incentive, encouraging individuals to read their bills. Maybe you should have a staff meeting and educate people about their benefits so they know what to expect and how their benefits should be utilized or how they can receive maybe a financial reward if they take advantage of making a high quality healthcare decision about themselves. So after you take those steps, you're getting ready, you're having these discussions, then you need to take a look at your existing document and make those revisions. The revisions should reflect the changes and the modifications you want to make for 2018. As Brady has explained month after month, there are so many uncertainties that still exist for 2018. What will or what will not happen? So when it comes to compliance, there are certain things that are still up in the air. Contraceptives the DOJ memo about how transgender benefits are going to be held. There are so many things that we still don't necessarily know. So what you can do and what you should do is make sure from a cost containment and a preference point of view that you're making those modifications to your plan document so you are ready to distribute that plan document to all your employees and all your participants. And most importantly, I'm going to say it again, to make sure that whatever it is that's in a document actually reflects the administration that you are doing or your your, your claims administrator is performing on your behalf. So the last thing I want to mention before I move on from this is that when you are looking at your document and you're trying to make these choices, maybe previously you were fully insured or you're working with someone who is fully insured and say, Fia, you've got such great ideas, but it is so difficult for me to take a look at all of my options and make a decision. You guys are in the business. You're the experts here. You should have all the best practices and all the recommendations for what it is that I should or shouldn't want to include in my plan. So to accommodate those situations where there are so many choices and maybe it's overwhelming, we created our flagship or best practices template that can accommodate including all of our recommendations and all of the best options within a single template. So it makes the drafting and completion of a plan document even easier. Thanks, Jen. So, I, I, you know, you, you actually just mentioned something regarding when there's lots of different choices and they don't know what to do or how to do it. And I'm really glad you touched on that because as far as I'm concerned, cost containment, first and foremost, comes in two flavors, right? There's automatic and then there's manual. Okay, automatic cost containment, those are the things I think are very popular because they're easy. It's that turnkey solution where, great example would be a PPO network, right? I mean, I guess a discount off a charge is a cost containment, right? It's a cost saving. Right. I don't have to do anything, right? If I'm the plan sponsor, you know, I've got a TPA, an ASO, a carrier. They know what my network is. They know what the discount is. The claims come in. If it's in network, they push a button, and it just reduces it by that discount rate. It's automatic. Uh, subrogation, great example. We do a lot of subrogation here at the FIA group. We get the claims data, scrub it, identify, go after the money, get it back. From the plan's perspective, the money just comes back as long as FIA gets the data. So it's all very automatic and it just happens. The other type of cost containment is the manual cost containment, and that's what Adam was talking about with incentives, where you need to not only put it in your plan, but you need to constantly remind HR, remind your people that we, it's out there. So we call that pre-service versus post-service, okay? By the time a person already has the surgery, obviously a cost containment language can help you limiting what you have to pay or helping you negotiate the payment. But if you can get a person to be steered into a facility that has high quality and low cost before, that's the best. That's the key. So one of the stories, and as story time, I do love telling stories. I mean, some of the stories I tell my kids, I can't believe they believe them, to be honest with you. Like yesterday, the bunny that was on the plane with me that was hopping from seat to seat to seat and then jumped on another plane that flew in right into our office. So they believed that story yesterday. Wait, that wasn't true, Adam. No, it wasn't. <laughs> but the reason I bring this up is we incentivize our employees by giving them $100 
just to talk to HR about their surgery options. Now, why is that important? Last year, sorry, this year, we have spent so far $2,600 on that service. That means 26 different people have received $100 for speaking with Linda in our HR department. What has that done? That in turn, we know for a fact, we're not sure about every dollar, but we know that saved us over $200,000 in just choices of facilities. So it was worth, it's called a 99% ROI, guys. That's a return, okay, on something like that. So what I tell people is by incentivizing your employees to choose facilities that are better priced, lower priced, high quality before is the way to go. Now, we talk about SPD cost containment. Jen focuses on compliance, and she's going to talk about the different levels of compliance you need to do. We, Ron and I focus more on cost containment. Cost containment comes out of, down to three things. One is anything non-network, so that's going to cover a reference-based pricing, negotiating claims, so it's clear you're not negotiating claims in network, sure. all out-of-network claims and carve-outs. All of these pieces tie into stuff you actually can negotiate. The only other thing that you can negotiate are the actual network contracts. So there's only two pieces, really. So when I said three, I really meant to say two, because at the end of the day, Carvel and RBP are both under the same umbrella of non-network, either in-network or they're out. So what your SPD, when you go into it, the way we teach our team is, okay, look at every single situation. Is it an in-network solution? Is there an in-network solution or not a network solution? And if it's not a network solution, are you better off with an in-network solution? For example, you might have a quote-unquote, on average, 75% discount by paying reference-based pricing, Medicare plus 130, but you know what? On a narrow network in Eastern Mass, I can get a 75% discount without having potential threat of balance billing. So that's how we look at it. So what we would advise you is, if you're not sure if your cost containment is up to snuff, if you want to see what other options are there, it's not just enough that we receive a copy of your plan doc. We would also need to see what your claim spend is on in-network versus out-of-network claims, as well as understand the percentage of claims that are uh, that are out of network mm -hmm. in the first place. Jen? All right. So as we're getting ready for 2018, it's time to take a look at our documents. I said it again, and I'll say it again and again. So when was the last time that you had your document reviewed from an outside perspective? When was the last time it was reviewed for compliance? When was the last time it was reviewed for ERISA concerns, ACA concerns, or cost containment concerns that Adam was just talking about? It's important to remember that maybe you don't necessarily need to have all three of those categories of review year after year. Maybe you already are confident that your document is in compliance with ACA. Maybe you're confident that your document already is in compliance with the ERISA requirements. Maybe you just want to target a review. So we have created different levels or different opportunities where we can really narrow in and provide a targeted compliance risk assessment based on the threats that might be available to a particular group. So the first level would be for us to take a look at the document from a healthcare healthcare reform compliance perspective. Maybe you created a document with FIA one year ago or two years ago, and you know that you already have all the ERISA SPD pieces taken care of. Maybe you're already confident that you have cost containment outlined within the document, but you just want to make sure over the past year or so that any of the modifications that are required or maybe not required as part of ACA are still in existence in your plan and still comply with the requirements. We can take a look at it from just the healthcare reform perspective. The second tier, the second level, would be taking a look at the ACA or the healthcare reform piece, as well as those ERISA compliance factors. So maybe you have a, a plan that is um, an ASO plan, and maybe there may not be as much of an opportunity to modify some of the provisions and the benefits. But maybe you want that targeted review of just healthcare reform and ERISA compliance. We can do that. And the third tier is we're going to go all out. We're going to take a look at healthcare reform. We're going to take a look at ERISA compliance. And we're going to tell you all of our thoughts, like it or not, about cost containment items. So maybe. So not only did you get Jen in level one and level two, <laughs> you get a little Ron and Adam That's right. with level three. So obviously, there's three different pricing mechanisms. But at the end of the day, Jen, what I think we have a problem with in our industry is people say, oh, yeah, we reviewed our plan doc. What are you actually looking at? Because, right. like you said, that limited scope piece around Obamacare is very different than knowing what Wyoming state law allows or doesn't allow. Exactly. Like, oh, I have a dialysis carve-out. Is it legal? Right. To those are three totally
totally different things, and we want to make sure that the public understands that as we discuss it. So great, great points. So the thing to consider is that maybe a full scope review is not going to be relevant for you or necessary for you. Maybe you don't want to review my 30 pages of commentary about your document. Maybe you just want a couple of pages. So if you have a plan that maybe uh, has been recently restated, you just want to have a targeted review, maybe you're concerned that your document isn't necessarily where it needs to be, or you just want to make sure that the changes that have occurred in the past year or the past six weeks for that matter are outlined and your document is in compliance. So whatever your concern is, whatever you're worried about, please send us those documents and we can help you with those reviews. We can target and narrow in on a uh, limited scope review that's actually going to meet your needs without providing you too much information or not enough information. This service is going to work to just provide you that extra set of comfort to make sure that you are ready to enter 2018 with the review that matters the most to you. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ron. All right. I'm getting ready to go on a tear here. Let's do this thing. Huh? <laughs> All right. Hey. You got about you got about 17 minutes, so just be careful, okay? You want you want me to relax? Good Thanksgiving. You want me to relax? And the first slide you put up in front of me is subrogation. Come on, who decided this? All right, listen, subrogation. Everybody knows that since the beginning of time, the first caveman that subrogated against another caveman sent a signed <laughs> subrogation agreement, right? These questionnaires. And I actually remember this was years and years ago, but we love the video. There was an episode of Judge Judy, and one of the people on the show who was going after their neighbor for something or another claimed that they were getting insurance bills, insurance bills, and they wanted to add it to the damages. And I remember Judge Judy picks up a fear group subrogation questionnaire <laughs> right there on camera, right next to her face, our logo, and she's saying, this is not a bill. This is something that they paid on your behalf, and when you recover money from a third party, you're going to have to reimburse them. So I'm not going to add it to your damages. It just means when you get something, if you get something, darling, you're going to have to reimburse <laughs> these guys. And uh, you better believe we followed up once we saw that you got a verdict in her favor. But the point is, <laughs> signed subrogation agreements, I think, really originally, uh, they, they started to be used because it, it, it felt good to have something in hand, right? One, you were getting the accident details in writing, so you were able to hand it off to somebody to handle the case, because I don't think that electronic files were really as popular at the time. It was good to have that paper file, have the details in writing, be able to pass it around. Two, uh, you know, a lot of stop-loss carriers, reinsurance, they liked being able to get something, a, a photocopy or a fax of the questionnaire, so that they knew the TPA in the plan were doing their job, going after the money, and they had something in writing so that they could hold it, you know, close to them at night, like their little teddy or their binky, and they could sleep comfortably knowing that you're doing something. And it was basically that, that, that the key that opened the lock that allowed them to reimburse the plan. And, you know, even today, you sometimes hear when, when there may potentially be subrogation, third-party liability, the carrier saying to the plan or the TPA, we're not going to reimburse until we get a signed subro agreement. But that is very rare these days. And the reason being is because if the carrier knows you're pursuing subrogation rights and you have the information and you share it with them, it doesn't matter if it's a signed subro agreement. And we very early on used to make the argument that sometimes a signed subro agreement could be a bad thing because if the court looks at it as a contract, that's a state law issue. So where does that leave us today? We have identified additional tools, methods for obtaining information about the accident, where it happened, what happened, who the adjuster, claim number, policy number. And so these questionnaires are not necessary anymore. They certainly provide uh, value, but not the kind of value they used to provide. Here's the bottom line, Ron, and then we can go right to jump right into the next slide if you want to, Brady. Yeah, feel free. Really quick to understand this. We've used our offset provision more forcefully and with a better result than anything else that we have at this company. So I can tell you that in the 18 years that we have run FIA, we've had plan language in those plan docs for those 18 years. Obviously, questionnaires help, but very rarely are we able to tell an attorney, hey, listen, buddy, you got to pay us back because the member signed this form a year and a half ago agreeing to reimburse the plan. Mm -hmm. It's the same argument that people say, well, the, the hospital maybe signed this document agreeing to pay it back in full the entire bill, even though I don't know what the bill is, right? Sure. What we realize is when we have attorneys that try to be, become mavericks and on their own just not reimburse liens, which we've seen more and more of depending on what state you're in, the offset provision, the ability to tell a member, hey, we have claims here that aren't even paid yet. If you don't reimburse the plan, 
we're not going to pay these other and future bills. Offset is a great way. You don't necessarily have to do it, but the threat of doing it is much more important and much more powerful than any signed subrogation form or any accident questionnaire that you might receive. And that offset provision in the plan document in general, Adam, is enforced in federal court where your rights are stronger. Whereas a signed subro agreement may be seen as a contract, in which case you're trying to enforce it in state court where your rights are weaker. I will tell you, though, Adam, you talk about these attorneys that they ignore us, regardless of whether there's a signed subro or strong claim language or anything else. The big issue, this is becoming more popular right now. I truly believe that you're starting to see attorneys trying to push the envelope. They're dispersing funds, and they're basically challenging us, challenging us to go after the money. So... If in the past you were relying on the attorney or the adjuster cutting you a check and sending you the money without you having to actively pursue it, those days are over. I don't know what conference someone told all these trial attorneys, these personal injury attorneys, hey, listen, you get a lien, just ignore it, disperse the money, 50% of the time, nothing will happen. So how you deal with these types of issues, these appeals, these types of uh, disputes. You know, sometimes the plan language is clear. Adam mentioned before the, the, the shopping plan document has an instruction manual. Um, if the plan document is clear, great. But if it's not clear and these new situations are coming up, whether it's a attorney dispersing funds or a denied claim being appealed and the plan document is not clear, somebody's going to have to make a judgment call. Somebody's going to have to exercise discretionary authority. And the problem is a lot of people purchase what they call insurance because they don't like risk. And I don't think it's necessarily always about financial risk. I think they don't want to have the risk of having to make these tough decisions. And so as we start to see new employers self-fund, they're not in the business of making these decisions. So as the types of issues and disputes increase and the number of self-funded employers that don't like to make decisions increase, we're headed for a tipping point. And that's why you're going to have to identify some sort of objective third party who's willing to make these types of decisions for the plan to deal with these tough, tough times. As we get into, here's the reality, folks. As we move away from whether it's right or wrong, the pure, simple, large PPO network arrangement into something else where there's a lot more involvement, there's a lot more risk involved, there's more noise, more and more plan sponsors need to think about the fact that even I want to reduce my overall costs, and because I'm heading into areas where, you know, it's basically the Wild West, you know, we're going into uncharted territory, it does make sense to transfer that fiduciary duty when necessary especially when you're trying some new cost containment initiatives. So speaking of opportunities to contain costs and maybe uh, being willing to, to share some of the responsibility with a third party, let's start by talking about claims that are paid in error and overpayments. Um, I have a big, big issue with two types of people, the ones who say that overpayments should not happen. Um, listen, if you think overpayments shouldn't happen, then you don't understand claims processing. Overpayments happen for a number of different reasons. It's not always the claims processor's fault, not always the TPA's fault. Sometimes it's the result of fraud or misrepresentation. But even when it is the uh, TPA's, I'll use the word fault, but I don't really mean it, um, when you look at the volume of claims that come through, the fact that one or two claims may potentially be overpaid due to some sort of clerical or administrative error, is a fact, and we all know it. And if you think you were fully insured, these issues wouldn't happen. Yeah, they do happen, except in a fully insured situation, that carrier, A, either A, could draw the money back, or B, they'll just, you know what, we'll write it off and increase our premiums next year, and we'll make it back that way. With a self-funded plan, the other type of person I have an issue with is the one who says, oh, goodness, an overpayment happened. I made a mistake. I don't want anyone to know. I'm just going to let it slide. That, to me, is worse than making the overpayment in the first place. It's almost as if I start a fire in my family room. My sofa is aflame. There's a big old fire extinguisher right next to it. It's not one of the ones that were recalled, so it's safe. And I choose not to put the fire out, even though I have the opportunity to do so, because I would be somehow admitting it's my fault. Accept that overpayments happen, pick up the fire extinguisher, and put it out. And that means sometimes utilizing people who are specialists in that regard. Again, cost containment. Um, in addition to that, when you think about these types of cost containment scenarios, you know, what are you doing to make sure we're paying the right amount? And if we pay too much, what are you doing to get the money back? Who more and more is starting to ask that type of question? It's the broker. When you go to these conferences and you go up and down the aisles and you see all these tables and all these vendors and they're, they're giving out the stress, the squeezy balls and the, the pens with the highlighters on the back that, you know, work for a week and then they die. You know, I love those things. You know, I end up bringing an extra rolling bag with me just for all these toys. But the thing is, as many as these great options are, 
you're starting to see now the type of people who are shopping around and talking to them, they're changing. It's not just the TPAs anymore. The brokers are getting more and more interested in all these solutions that are out there, and they're starting to confront these TPAs, and they're saying, what are you doing about overpayments? What are you doing about subrogation? Hey, have you ever heard of reference-based pricing? Do you offer an RBP program? What about dialysis carve-outs? If you cannot answer those questions, you're going to miss out on these business opportunities. So again, understanding how to distinguish yourself from the competition in that regard. Go up and down the aisles and be able to say, I know what that guy does. As far as other uh, stop loss of vendor relations, again, as a plan and the TPA, you are the middleman. On the one hand, you have your stop loss policy, which is covering the plan. And on the other hand, you have this vendor that you're contracting with in order to create cost containment which is interesting because this is the picture I used to paint when I talked about PPOs. I used to all the time talk about how if you're using a PPO, you have a contract with them, and you use stop loss, you have a contract with them, and the PPO and stop loss don't owe any obligation to each other. This is now the same issue, but with stop loss and vendors. Mm -hmm. Just because you're using a medical tourism company or an RBP program or a dialysis carve-out program, and Jen mentioned this earlier, if it's not in the plan document, you probably haven't conveyed that to stop loss. And my first question to you is, why not? If you're doing this in order to contain costs, don't you want to take credit? Stop loss may reduce your rates as a result. One, one of the simple, and again, just for the sake of time, a couple of things you need to make sure you do. One, in regards to the employee handbook, the leave of absence provision, which Brady is an expert in, is the number one area of gaps. We see them in 90% of the plan docs that we look at and the handbooks. Number two, in regards to stop, in regards to stop loss policies, if you ask me, and I literally, we have a new attorney here by the name of Harry. I think he might quit, guys, by the way. He's been here for a couple weeks. I think I'm scared of this kid. I don't know. Trial by fire. Not everyone is ready to work with me. But anyways, the point I'm trying to make is I ask him a basic question. Who, is the who has the best stop loss contract? Who has the worst stop loss contract? And why? And it's not a list of 80 things. Brady and our team do a great job of listing every single thing that's a gap. But what are the main areas? The number one area is do they have the ability to reprice claims on their own? Number one. Two, do they have the right to interpret your plan? Three, do they take away any discretionary authority that you may have that you hold valuable? Those three things are the key. It doesn't matter if you're R &B, uh, a reference-based pricing plan, a network plan. At the end of the day, when a million-dollar claim comes in and you decide to pay X, are they going to be able to say, no, you should have paid Y? and therefore I'm not reimbursing you. Therefore, the reason I have stop loss insurance in the first place is gone. That is the ultimate question, Ron. You know, speaking of the types of things that are creating these conflicts, Adam, one of the biggest, I think, is the specialty drugs. And we talked already about the issue with the drugs and the new uh, appointee by Trump and his reference to drugs. And this is the new flavor of the week is the issue with drug costs. But it's not a recent issue, particularly specialty drugs. And first and foremost, if you think that your, PP, your PBM is there in order to reduce the expense you spend on drugs in general, not just specialty drugs, but in general, you're wrong. PBM's primary mission is to ensure an effective, efficient purchasing and distribution of medication. They're not necessarily advocating for the plan or looking for cost reductions in the price of drugs in general. Now, tap into that, specialty drugs, often they don't even address specialty drugs. These are purchased outside your PBM arrangement. But even if the PBM somehow does offer a specialty drug program, chances are, just like other prescriptions, they're just in the process of ensuring you're getting the proper drug delivered per your plan, et cetera. They're not actually advocating or reducing the cost. We have some great partners that we work with that can help you with specialty. I'll tell you right now, if I was starting a brand new company and I was looking for a cost containment opportunity, this is where I'd focus on. So if I wasn't in the plan dog business and all the other fun stuff that we do, this is where I believe a future of huge opportunity and savings, whether it's the PBM contracts, et cetera, but really figuring out what to do about specialty drugs and coming up with an actual solution that works. There's a couple of companies that we work with that I think have some great solutions, but obviously 2018, as we look at the crystal ball, is pretty much going to be a year where I think we're going to see a lot more opportunity and savings here that we currently see in the marketplace today, Ron. Yeah, definitely. And I think that people are getting the, the news about, you know, PPOs. Yeah, they apply a discount, but they're not addressing the actual cost. It's time to start looking at the PBM and what they actually do as well. Um, another issue that's starting to drive cost, or at least continuing to drive cost, and we don't see it changing in 2018, is the issue of network contracts. Now, there are good networks out there. There are ways to use networks. We're not going to come in and say, hey, replace all your networks, period. 
So we do think you need to re-examine how you do it. If you think discounts are all there is to it, you're wrong. Um, one of the examples being, of course, and this is something we constantly see, are the issues of upside-down DRGs and actually having to pay more than the charge amounts and things of this nature. Your plan language should specifically address how you do this. But take note, if you implement cost containment language in your plan document, meaning we pay the lesser of the network rate or the build amount, and the network rate is actually more than the build amount, if you pay the network rate because you're worried about breaching your network contract, stop loss is probably going to pay as if you had paid the build amount. Do you understand the issue? So again, complying with your plan language is not only important as a fiduciary, it's also important as far as coordinating with stop loss. Um, additionally, other types of considerations. The carve out, again, if you want to carve out certain types of expenses, uh, the high cost but low frequency claims, I'm all for it. There's definitely right ways to do it and wrong ways to do it. But ensuring that there are no other network contracts or other contracts or agreements that contradict what you're trying to do is so important. Because even though your plan may be compliant and legal, the employer could be sued for breach of contract or something else of that nature. So again, ensuring that there's no contradictions or conflicts when you implement these programs is important as well, and we know what to look for to ensure that's not there. Uh, last but certainly not least, RAP networks. I believe RAP networks are this, you know, the, the second parachute in the bag when the first one doesn't work, but it's one of those parachutes, the umbrella that you get in a cocktail. So you've got it, but it's not really all that effective. But at least you feel really safe knowing you have it, and but, now it's going to be bound to build. But if you're the fiduciary, you can say you did what's reasonable. Sure. You're being prudent. Hey, that's the best we could have gotten. No one's going to go to jail for using a RAP network. No one's going to get an award for using a RAP network. But it definitely protects you. It's, not it's, just, it's something. You can actually say to a reasonable person, I got a 20% discount. Even though my mother could have called and got a 40% discount, I still got one. So we see the value in them because it's easy and it protects you. And in the day and age of everyone suing everyone, I can see why people are attracted to them. There are better options where you can transfer that fiduciary risk and maybe save money for your, for your clients. But I think the most important thing here today in the last minute that we got, Ron, is for everyone on the call to remember whose money that we're spending. We're spending that construction worker who's getting 20% of his salary taken out to put into an employee benefit plan, and then you as an administrator are just clicking a button, allowing all that guy's money to be spent for one bill without really looking into it and diving deeper. That is a moral question, I believe. We have a moral obligation to empower plans to lower the overall cost of care. I truly believe that. This is a charitable thing. I think it's a good thing to do for society. So we're not saying wraps are evil. It, they're definitely easy. And anything easy in today's healthcare world means you're probably overpaying for it and not getting enough juice, not getting enough meat on the bone in that regard. I would agree with you. It's a good litmus. So a couple questions. Obviously, December 19th, folks, this is a picture of us um, during our volunteer event. I am that good-looking guy on the bottom right. You'll see. <laughs> and, Ron, where are you? Are you in this thing? I think I may be holding, holding the, the camera Ron? at him. Oh, Ron, told, no, you're in there somewhere, I think, Ron. Anyways, December 19th, we are focusing exclusively on scaring the living daylights out of everyone on the call mm -hmm. and talk about fiduciary transfer, fiduciary duties, breach of fiduciary duties, all the stories, all the cases that are coming down, what you could have done in that particular situation to help yourself, and then proactively what you could do going forward in your plan design. So we're going to make it that this is stuff that could have happened to you in 2017, but you're going to be nice and protected in 2018. <laughs> so it's going to be a, a raw and heavy hour, so be ready to mute your lines. Ron and I are going to be taking it over. I don't know if we'll have any time for Jen. No, certainly not. I mean, I tell she'll be at work. I tell she'll be at work. We're doing she Plan on two hours. Well, we hope to have uh, Brady here as well to tell us what happened in D.C. to prove that he was wrong. Really quick, we have time for two questions. One question is, can you address overrides? For example, a member has stage four cancer, no medication, except a $28,000 drug for 30 days. Plan only pays up to $2,500 per medication. If you over, I love this question. If you override for one member, do you got to override for all of them? Jen, is there a conflict there? Yeah, this is a big problem. This goes back to the Macy's case, right? We're asking and doing things outside the terms of the plan. There are other op options here when you want to have something like this in place. There's provisions like an alternative care provision, or maybe you can add something to your medical necessity definition about off-label drug use. But the important key here is if this is paid, guess who may not reimburse? Stop loss. That's right. 
So I know we also had another question, Adam, and it related to the fact that if we make the plans more attractive in order to keep those people on the plan, uh, this was in response to the individual mandate issue, don't we run the risk of bumping into the threshold for Cadillac tax purposes? And one thing that I want to make sure people understand, because the rest of our presentation related to cost containment, is that sometimes the most effective, most generous, most beneficial plans, it doesn't just mean giving more. All right, paying for more, doing more, a higher percentage or more uh, funds. It also means containing costs. Uh, we don't actually have the slide in this webinar, but Adam, I know in the past you've shared, and I'm sure if people go to our website and download some of the past webinars, they'll see it, what the cost of our plan is per person. And it's not a matter of the employer being more generous, but rather the fact that the employer and the employees are being more careful about what we're actually spending. So, you know, getting to profit could either mean increasing revenue or reducing cost. And I think what we've done to avoid the Cadillac tax issue is we're focusing much more on cost than we are on the payout. Well, folks, we thank you all so much. To all of you who dialed in, we wish you all a happy Thanksgiving to you and your families. Hope you have a great businesses and close a lot of deals over the next month. On behalf of Brady, Jen McCormick, Ron Peck, and myself, thank you so much for joining us on the Fee Group Empowering Plans webinar. See you on December 19th. Goodbye.